Explorers and adventurers rely on maps before setting out. Importantly, mapping out their coordinates correctly and verifying the location before embarking on the journey. The historical shipwreck. Finding expert Daryl Miklos, who led the Caribbean expedition, was famous for finding several fascinating shipwreck materials. His findings attracted the attention of government and officials. Recently, he made another discovery of a large piece of gold in the waters of Turks and Caicos Island, which was mind-blowing and seemed to set the crew up for a luxury lifestyle. Join us as we talk about how Miklos teams found gold in the seas. Miklos Gold Expedition Cooper was armed with an ancient tale from Spain about a fully loaded trunk full of gold that sank around Turks and Caicos Island. He read the book to his crew about different types of cargo containing gold, silver and precious stones. He came up with 13 star coordinates from Gordon Cooper's map. He said he believed they were in the middle of historical discoveries in modern history. Miklos crafted coordinates in the form of a square shape on the location that will lead up to the gold. There were sharp stones beside the waterbanks and beneath it, which answers to several shipwrecks on the location. To cover a large area on the water, they use an iron-based shipwreck material. It doesn't discover silver or gold, but once they find materials like cannons and panels, it will lead to the shipwreck gold. They use the detector to search the entire area back and forth till they reach the full meter. They would also find anomalies in the area and drive under them. Luckily, they were able to find some crash leftover signals, and so they were sent scuba divers down there to explore more. Miklos said hopefully the stars are aligning in their favor. Michael sent the divers with an instruction not to stay for too long underwater, but to return after their third round of checks. While underwater the visibility wasn't clear, they couldn't find the site where the buoy hit the bottom and the reading seemed fake. After a while, they couldn't bear their bearings again, so they went up to reconnect. The swimmers went underwater again after a few minutes of rest. In another location, luckily they were able to get a signal through their hand equipment. They started digging for the signal they'd received. Shortly after they found their target, a large piece of gold. Gordon Cooper was chosen to pilot NASA's longest and final Mercury mission, Mercury Atlas 9, in 1963, making him the first American to spend a whole day in space, the first to sleep in space, and the last to undertake an entirely solo orbital mission. His mission came as Cold War tensions reached a climax, with the Cuban Missile Crisis a year earlier threatening World War III. With emotions running high, the US administration asked Mr. Cooper to photograph as much of the Earth as possible to gain a sense of potential Soviet advances, particularly in the Caribbean. Cooper was assigned to examine the effects of zero gravity on the human body before safely returning to Earth. The public was only aware of those two responsibilities, but many of the mission objectives were classified, one of which was taking a large number of shots. He took over 5,000 photos. But this wasn't just about taking nice pictures. There was another goal behind all the space photos, which included looking for covert Soviet nuclear facilities and submarines. Cooper would then highlight on a map the likely sites off the coast of the United States, providing crucial intelligence for the country's defense at the time. While looking for these harmful places, Cooper discovered something else that didn't make sense. He noticed these magnetic variations through the camera, but they were not the right size or shape to be nuclear storage facilities, and many were in the shallow waters of the Caribbean. This piqued Mr. Cooper's interest. He needed to figure out what these strange marks were, so he created a new map of all the anomalous sites. Mr. Cooper completed 22 revolutions around the Earth while in orbit, and he was also part of the last manned space expedition. But the variation lingered in his mind, and for reasons unexplained, he never contacted NASA about his strange discoveries. Instead, he wanted to figure out what they were himself. He kept it to himself for 40 years, going off on a self-provided expedition during his spare time. As he explored, he realized several of these oddities were spread over old Spanish ship trade routes, 
making him wonder if the blips were shipwrecks. However, Mr. Cooper died in 2004, but his efforts were not in vain. He donated his map to close friend Daryl Miklos, who pushed the Discovery Channel's Cooper's Treasure series to realize his buddy's ambition. The footage shows Mr. Miklos taking a chance on the first location in 2017. He stated that under normal conditions, he wouldn't just rush into a site, but this one is so close, and Gordon's map has an arrow pointing to it. He further states that he's only going to see whether the magnetometer detects anything. If it does, he'll dive on it, and if he finds anything, it means he has discovered a wreck that Gordon detected from space. The magnetometer is about as homemade as it gets. My buddy and I built it, but it works well. What it does is take up magnetic readings from iron-made items as we move through, which is how we find the early stages of shipwreck debris. Almost immediately, the magnetometer detected a signal and Mr. Miklos jumped into the water. He exclaimed, Oh my God, I got it. I need to get into that water right now since the weather is turning awful. I'm following the line down. I have about four feet of vision and I've reached the bottom, but I'm picking up something that's vibrating like crazy. He claimed, look at this, this is fantastic. I'm seeing a wreck just like Gordon said. I'm not sure what it was, but the arrow was spot on. The chart is correct, and this is only the beginning. I just wanted confirmation up here. The show then reveals an astonishing perspective of a shipwreck, which was undated but in perfect condition. Mr. Miklos explained how the discovery prompted him to trust Mr. Cooper's knowledge, implying that additional discoveries may lie ahead. He continued, Over 60 properties are waiting for us. In this business, speed is of the essence. If Gordon took the time and trusted me with this information, I believe it is my responsibility to complete what he was unable to do. I have to do this. It's for my friend. Since 2017, the crew has produced several incredible discoveries, including gold in shipwrecks, estimated to be worth billions. The Columbus Anchor The anchor, discovered off the Turks and Caicos Islands, was analysed and found to date between 1492 and 1550. The anchor's total size and estimated weight of 1,200 to 1,500 pounds imply that it was a bower anchor from a 300-ton vessel which is typical for a Columbus-era ship. The expert Miklos said the anchor is from Christopher Columbus. Christopher Columbus, born in 1451, was a renowned Italian adventurer and navigator who was the first European to establish long-term contact with the Americas. Miklos discovered several Caribbean shipwrecks using a space treasure map produced by his late friend, NASA astronaut Gordon Cooper. Cooper made the map after his Mercury 9 Faith 7 trip. At the time, he may have been on a mission to identify Cold War nuclear threats. Miklos and a team of experts used Cooper's precise map and archival research to identify five colonial period wreck sites. The team uses a magnetometer to locate shipwrecks before diving down to conduct a closer investigation with a metal detector. The Turks and Caicos discovery is thought to be tied to Vicente Yanez Pinzon, a Spanish sailor who, together with his brother, Martin Alonso Pinzon, participated in the Columbus expeditions. Martin and Vicente were captains of the Pinta and Nina on Columbus's first trip in 1492. Six years later, at the time of Columbus's third journey, Vicente Pinzon left Spain with four caravels, tiny sailing ships, including the Pinta, on what became known as one of the expedition's minor voyages. In 1499 and 1500, Vicente Pinzon found Brazil and the Amazon River. In the spring of 1500, the captain met with Columbus in Haiti to discuss the Brazilian find before returning to Spain with his four ships. However, in July of that year, Vicente Pinzon's fleet was caught in a hurricane while anchored near the Turks and Caicos Islands, destroying two of his ships. Vicente Pinzon returned to the area in 15 and 2 to salvage goods from the two vessels. In addition to the anchor, Miklos's crew discovered an abundance of other items at the shipwreck site, including three grappling hooks from Columbus's time. The hooks were employed to recover valuables from sinking ships. In addition, some iron and bronze spikes, possibly the remaining relics of the sunken ships, and a shattered part of the anchor's ring were discovered. 
The shattered anchor ring may imply that the anchor came from a third ship in Pinzon's fleet that was pulled away from its anchor during the hurricane. The discoveries mark a breakthrough for the expedition. It proves the validity of Cooper's map and the tendency to find more artifacts and treasures. Immediately after raising the anchor, the Turks and Caicos Marine Patrol boarded and demanded that the item be returned to its undersea resting place. Miklos goes home, outraged after replacing the anchor on the ocean below, to plan another expedition this time in the Bahamas. Underwater alien building. The gold coins are the major surprise in another voyage's wrap-up of a very thrilling second season of Miklos and his crew voyage, including recovery expert Eric Schmidt, marine archaeologist Jim Sinclair, and mag and recovery expert Mike Perna. And unlike in the television series The Curse of Oak Island, the artifacts and treasure were discovered quickly. Eric Schmidt and Daryl Miklos are shown in one of the treasure hunting locations that astronaut Gordon Cooper sketched out from orbit in the 1960s. The sea is shallow and full of ship-eating coral reefs, which is why it is known as the Treasure Coast. This expedition marks the long-awaited discovery of actual gold, following a season of antiquities, ship anchors, nails, crystal deck prisms, and other period metal bits that led them to this most auspicious find. Miklos has been lucky enough to find more than just gold. He is convinced that extraterrestrial aliens have visited the location where he is seeking wealth. The Discovery Channel celebrity went on record with the Daily Mail and stated he discovered what could be a massive extraterrestrial structure at the bottom of the Atlantic Ocean off the Florida shoreline. Miklos asserts that an alien construction can be found 300 feet beneath the surface of the infamous Bermuda Triangle. He stated that he was trying to identify shipwreck material based on one of the anomaly readings on Gordon's charts when he noticed something that stood out and shocked him. It was unlike anything he had ever seen in terms of shipwreck debris. It was too large for that. It was also unlike anything he'd seen that was created naturally. Following the discovery of gold coins by Daryl and Eric, Miklos and his colleagues found an unidentified submerged object, USO, in the Bermuda Triangle near the Bahamas. The huge project phenomenon from the seafloor aroused him, and the abnormalities they had been recording did not exactly match this. Miklos was looking for shipwrecks when he explored the area in his submersible Nemo, but he believes he discovered something even more startling. He told the Globe and Mail, I was trying to identify shipwreck material based on one of the anomaly readings on Gordon's charts when I noticed something that stuck out, that shocked me. Lead sheathing. The recovery expert Mike Perna discusses the incredible discovery as Miklos and his crew drag up a chunk of lead sheathing. He said the crumpled up lead sheeting is the typical shipwreck piece of lead that was nailed to the hull of the vessel, and as the vessel came in and struck the bottom, it squeezed up. It got ripped off when we found something like that. It is an absolute indication that the shipwreck came through this area. These were strange metallic constructions under the water near the reefs of several islands in these seas that could transform from glassy and serene to turning and bubbling ship destroyers in an instant, aided in their destructive ways by razor-sharp coral and rock just beneath the surface. Previously, the crew, including Perna, Eric Schmidt, and marine archaeologist Jim Sinclair, flew in a plane with Eric aboard to survey the turquoise blue seas in a region known as Dragon's Teeth, which Gordon named. The episode also introduced Nemo, a high-tech submarine that would aid them in their search for relics. Rocky Cove and Reef's Edge were two sites where they discovered a large number of things. These appeared to be the shipwreck-filled Dragon's Teeth location Gordon had described. Mike Perna is a mag specialist, and he discovered big hits indicating metal on the seafloor. This brought Daryl and Jim down below, where they used Nemo to free dive and find a colonial anchor. However, this lead sheath offers up a whole new set of possibilities, as the guys attempt to put together the Rex debris pattern and field while searching for recoverable riches. A steamship and deck prism. In another scenario, Miklos's crew which includes marine archaeologist Jim Sinclair, 
magnetometry specialist Mike Perner was assisting him in the search for wealth in the wreckage of an early 1900s when a steamer was discovered along the shore. They are being directed by detailed charts created from orbit by Cooper's map wrecks that he believes may contain riches. The guys are astounded at the extent of the destruction and the amount of debris as Darrell, Eric Schmidt and Jim Sinclair swim over it all to plan where they will begin searching with metal detectors for anything recoverable. The work ahead of them appears immense and Darrell has to exclaim, this is beautiful, as he swims underwater with Eric and Jim, taking everything in. Darrell explains the action in a separate shot. This is a gigantic metal mess that we certainly picked up on the Mac, but we're here to find the weight pile that Gordon Cooper depicted in the drawing. Darrell and the team are then seen visiting the site of the metal-laden shipwreck, attempting to establish its purpose and historical period. Jim describes it as a 1900s riverboat, which will yield a really interesting relic for Miklos and company, a deck prism. In a separate shot, Sinclair discusses the discovery and its purpose. He said, It was dark below decks on ships in the late 1800s. They didn't need fire-filled lights dangling around down there, you know. You do not want fire on a ship. So what they came up with was a prism that could be fitted into the deck itself and reflected and refracted the sunlight that was hitting it down below decks, allowing a lot of light to enter the previously dark regions of the ship. According to Jim, this aging steamship was headed for Albert Town in the Bahamas. Miklos also affirmed it is yet another ship that has been eaten up by the shallow seas of the Caribbean. Iron grappling hooks. Darrell and the recovery specialist Eric Schmidt discover two well-preserved iron grappling hooks on the bottom, which date to the Columbus era. A grappling hook, also known as a grapnel, is a device with many hooks, known as claws or flukes attached to a rope. It is hurled, dropped, sunk, projected, or fastened directly by hand to catch and hold on to things. Typically, grappling hooks are used to temporarily secure one end of a rope. They can also be used to dredge up submerged objects. The gadget was devised by the Romans around 260 BC. The grappling hook was initially employed in naval combat to capture ship rigging and board it. They are thrilled with their discovery since they believe anyone employing grappling hooks would be attempting to rescue something important from the seafloor, implying that one of Columbus's ships is nearby. Darrell said the reason we're so delighted to uncover these grappling hooks is that we know the folks using them are attempting to retrieve really valuable stuff. In this episode, Darrell and his team dive into a variety of locales around the Turks and Caicos Islands, they are seeking a massive debris trail that they believe will lead them to a shipwreck buried in the sand. With their earlier discovery of an anchor that they believe could have belonged to one of Columbus's ships. However, not all dives are straightforward, with some spotting potential debris perched on the edge of near sheer ledges on the seafloor that drop off quickly into the depths. Miklos is now focused on proving the origin of his anchor. He stated that they didn't build these things with stamps on them that were built by Columbus. We're currently analyzing the region to see if we can locate any additional wreckage from that period, and the more you uncover, the more substantial the evidence. However, based on what we've seen thus far, I assume the anchor is from one of Columbus' ships, a pirate encounter. The show opens when Darrell Miklos and his crew are on high alert, after spotting a suspicious random boat in the middle of the open ocean near where they are planning a dive. The broad seas are scurvy dog territory, as wild and deadly as the mythical Old Wild West, where outlaws, pirates and criminals of different bands may get away with misconduct, murder and chaos. All of this is not lost on marine days, says the archaeologist Jim Sinclair, who was peeking over Darrell Miklos's shoulder, while Mike Perner glances over his for direction as he steers the boat broadside. Eric Schmidt takes a closer look while Miklos examines the issue. He decides to call off their scheduled dive and quickly retrieve the camera and gear. Miklos explains why he gave the warning. When you're miles from shore and all by yourself is when you're completely vulnerable. What they observe is a small ship monitoring their movements and then approaching Miklos, 
Eric Schmidt, Mike Perner, and Jim Sinclair, who were on a small boat filled with highly expensive recovery tech gear, cameras, and submersibles to examine a potential waste salvage dive site. The mysterious boat approaches the guys and the chit-chat begins. The other boaters inquire whether the Miklos crew is hunting for planes, prompting a strange conversation about what animals they are looking for. But this idle small conversation is just camouflage in such a period, and Perna is well prepared to hit the gas if gunfire breaks out. It's a serious, tense scenario. The team had tens of thousands of dollars of equipment in the middle of nowhere, potentially sitting on a wreck worth millions, so they have to have to be careful. The show follows Daryl Miklos's physical dives in the Bahamas and Florida. His aim this season is to discover the remains of 11 ships thought to carry large amounts of treasure. In doing so, he intends to verify, honor, and continue the work of astronaut Gordon Cooper, who left behind a treasure trove of maps indicating where suspected wreckage lurk in shallow waters. Cooper completed all of this mapping while orbiting the Earth's atmosphere in space. Miklos discovered treasures and relics straight away in the premiere, and this episode is part of the eight-week deadline to uncover recoverable gold, silver, and diamonds for good. He admitted in prior episodes that he was involved in an unpleasant situation, but he believes he has the proper core team and the best tools and technology to work hard, fast, and smart. Hunting in the Holy Grail region. The hunt began after Daryl was given valuable maps and notes created by Cooper while orbiting Earth which had previously been kept secret for 40 years. Cooper allegedly told Miklos to finish what he couldn't do, encouraging him to explore the charted shipwrecks and go for the gold. Daryl and his crew discovered period-correct nails, parts of a ship's rigging, and a cannon using Cooper's maps, marking the expedition's first major discovery. Miklos refers to the expanse of the ocean they were hunting in the Bahamas as the Holy Grail, because it could contain colonial-era shipwrecks. According to Miklos, the treasure-laden wrecks he seeks are in the waters of the Bahamas. He said Gordo Cooper was obsessed with the Bahamas and mapped the biggest treasure-filled wrecks off the islands. Miklos also has hundreds of photographs proving Cooper's mapping was correct, verifying numerous of the wrecks he noticed from space. The old Bahamas had roots that ate ships alive in the dangerous shallows. On Cooper's treasure, Miklas maps spots to focus each recovery dive. The images and maps all connect, which is why the Bahamas have become the focus of Miklas's hunt. The crew also found square head nails from the 1600s, a square-cut iron pin, a mast dead eyes. A dead eye was used mainly in rigging for things like mast stays and could also function as a pulley. A dead eye is a device used in the standing and running rigging of classic sailing ships. It is a smallish, circular, thick wooden disc with one or more holes perpendicular to its plane. The most prevalent types of dead eyes are single and triple. The three hold blocks were termed dead eyes because their positions resembled the eye and nose sockets of a sheep's skull. Single dead eyes, also known as bull's eyes, are used to guide and manage a line as well as to change its direction, especially in older boats. Triple dead eyes are used in pairs. A cord is threaded through the holes between them, allowing them to work similarly to a block and tackle. This provides a mechanical advantage by tugging harder on whatever the dead eyes are fastened to. Pairs of dead eyes are installed in the shrouds, the lines that support the mast, where they are used to increase tension. In recent decades, as steel wire became the most common material for sailboat rigging, Dead eyes and cords were replaced with metal turnbuckles for tensioning wires. However, with the introduction of high strength and low stretch synthetic fibers, some sailboats are now using synthetic rope for standing rigging, while dead eyes and lines are regaining popularity as apprehension devices. Miklos's father, Roger, is also a treasure seeker. In the early 1980s, he claimed to have discovered the Pinta one of Columbus's three ships on his first expedition. However, the discovery near the Bahamas sparked controversy. Even his son has reservations, stating that he feels that the wreckage and debris discovered are from the same era, 
and he does not want to follow in his father's footsteps. Miklos claimed he wanted to produce a substantial discovery in his way properly, using scientific procedures that everyone can appreciate. This is not Miklos the sequel, this is Cooper's treasure. It's me on a journey to discover what Gordon put me out there for. Miklos began hanging out with Cooper as a youngster, and despite their 36-year age difference, they built a close bond and mentorship. Miklos recounted that he remembered how Cooper spoke, his pregnant pauses, his gentle demeanor. You'd think someone that polite wouldn't be a superhero, but he genuinely is. He's an amazing person, and I miss conversing with him more than anyone can fathom. Miklos claims it would take 1,000 years to study all 60 anomalies on Cooper's treasure map with only one crew. If he owned 50 boats, he would require 50 years. He further states that he could hear Gordon all the time in the back of my head saying, you're on the right trail. What are your thoughts on his historical discovery? Leave them in the comment section. Also make sure you like, share and subscribe for more fascinating stories.